Hey everybody, this is uh, Peter Zelenka, and I'm in charge of the new Cosmography Eclipse, which you've probably seen by now. And one of the things that I noticed was Randall had a really interesting discussion on Google Earth and the area around the RICAT structure. But unfortunately, in the original clip, it was a little bit degraded. So I thought I'd get him back on and we can go through it again live and give you some new updates. So Randall, if you want to take it away. Oh, uh, thank you, Peter. Um, and yeah, after I reviewed it, I, I guess I had never actually seen it. Um, but having now reviewed those few minutes, I'm thinking, yeah, we can uh, definitely re-record that with higher quality because we've certainly improved our technology since that was filmed almost a year and three quarters ago. Plus, I've added a few additional things to enhance the, the whole um, process in terms of the information. So I guess I will just jump over into Google Earth and we'll take a look here and see what we're seeing. Okay, here we go. All right, so here we are, let me zoom out so we can get the, the context of it here. We're looking at uh, Western Africa, Sahara Desert, Tropic of Cancer, just below the Tropic of Cancer into Mauritania is where we have the RECAT or ICAT structure. And what we were pointing out in the the, the investigation and analysis of this particular structure was, I think the first thing we started looking at was the topography and the elevation. So I'm hovering over the center of the structure here, and we're at about 1400 feet above sea level right here in the center of the structure. And then as I move out towards the rim, we're generally about 1400 feet. If I go down here to the southwestern corner, we're down to just a little less than 1400 it appears that there's a slight tilting of the whole structure towards the west and so it's in the middle of this this feature here which i'm going to back out a little bit you can see it's almost like a rupture in the in the bedrock here um, that has exposed this underlying structure which in other video clips I explain as a, an upward domed structure. And um, that's generally the geological explanation that we've looked at in detail uh, in the extended version of this. So I would refer anybody uh, to check that out. But when I go up here to the north of this, I'm at about 23, 2400 feet above sea level here. When I move down to the southeast, I'm at about a thousand, about eleven hundred feet. So you can see there's also sort of a gradient fall from northwest to southeast. If I go up here to the head of the structure, I'm at about sixteen hundred. And then when I go down here to this area, and and I'm going to get into discussing the 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 texture here of the of the landscape and how it changes right in here. But I'm looking at about twenty seven hundred ninety, twenty five hundred feet in here. So this is this you can actually see is kind of an upwarped ridge of uh, with exposed bedrock in here. So I go up here. We're at about fourteen hundred. Then I go up here to the to the uh, northeast. And when I come down here over this area where you can see exposed bedrock, uh, let's see. Some of this area here is oh fourteen hundred, fifteen hundred. But then we'll see that we're moving off rapidly. It drops off to sea level. And so over a very short period of time, uh, geographic area, what I'll do is take and, and we'll measure uh, to see how much the distance is here. So we're moving um, about 234 miles. Okay, so in that you've got a gradient drop of, of 1,500 feet or more. So what's happening here, I think is, and this is what I'm going to be getting at, is that there appears to be considerable evidence of large-scale movement of water over this landscape. So it looks to me like perhaps two things happened here. You had a domal uplift, which fractured the bedrock here. And then you had flows of water that, and I'll show you why I think they were coming from the northeast, flowing off towards the southwest to, to ocean. And it would have removed this material here, exposing the, the circular ring structure. Um, I'm going to zoom on in here like this, and we're going to look at the, the periphery of this thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump it into 3D, and then we're going to pivot on around, 
and you'll be able to see these cliffs here. I'm going to zoom on in. So it appears that there was an enormous amount of erosion off of this upland surface here, which right here is right at about 2,000 feet. And then when I get down here onto the desert floor, I'm at about 1,000 feet. So there's a topographic differentiation here of about 1,000 feet from up here on this um, plateau surface down to the bedrock floor. And we can see a good bit of headwall erosion here, which would suggest that there was some pretty major flows off the surface of this upland area down into the desert. And we see the, the, the fan material spread out. We can actually see that, you know, the water has left a very characteristic uh, flow patterns here on, on the floor. And so this looks like it's probably the result of a series of pluvial events that over the course of many millennia has eroded these uh, these channels, these canyons into the flanks of this feature. We can go along here and all along here, there's a there's this cliff face. Yeah, look at here, this is um, very, here you have an example of headwall erosion. So if there's another pluvial event, which is rainfall intensely enough to generate large mega flows off of this upland, this headward erosion will proceed to move upstream, to move up current. Because as the current flows over, it basically plucks and quarries the material from the head wall, which just keeps it moving uh, upstream in, in effect. Now, if we let's zoom on out here, you can see the whole context of this thing. Yeah, there's a lot of, okay, look at this right here. So it looks like there had been a, uh, a surface flow meandering over the bedrock, and then it incised just enough that it captured successive flows, allowing this meandered type channel here to, to be carved. So let's see, that's 1433, that's 17. So it's about a 300, this is about 300 feet deep right here. Okay, so I'm going to back on out. I'm going to flip it around so we're oriented north again. Go back to 2D. So I want to look at some of these interesting features that we see here. When we start looking, when we zoom in on this right here, we get a pretty amazing texture. Look at this. Now we can see some very distinct chevron type formations in here, which is consistent with water flow. Look at here, you see kind of pointing up upstream. So it appears that we have evidence here of major water flows coming from the northeast to the southwest. This has all the earmarks of of topography that has been shaped by flowing water. And let's see here if there's any further evidence to suggest flowing water. Yeah, check this out. We have here what appear to be giant current ripples. And again, current ripples are transverse to current flow. So that would that would be consistent with the flow coming off the, the uplands going towards the ocean. Now, this is something happening very interesting. These lineations like this, there are similar lineations found in North America. I've studied a number of them. We'll look at those in a minute. Look at here. Here's more what appears to be current ripples. So let's see. Yes. Then here you've got this. I would say probably the result of accelerated erosion. You can see here, if we zoom in again, we see these chevron shapes in here. Now, if I, I'm going to zoom on out all the way out, and then I'm going to swing on around, come on into 
the channel Scablands, where we have definite evidence of major water created landscapes. All right, look at this. You have the same type of set chevron shapes here. This was a flow uh, east to west. Very similar topography that you can see here. Look at this. You see these chevron shapes where the point of the chevron is pointing up current. So in other words, the floods were coming from the right side of the screen to the left, correct? Yes. Yes, that's that's exactly right. See, so then if I go to some of these other landscapes, like let's come across here where we have one of the outstanding drumlin fields. Um, might not be able to see it too well because of the, the canopy of foliage, but you can see there are lineations. Um, Maybe what I'll do is I'll stop share for a second and then I will open. While you're doing that, Randall, I thought I'd mention that when you were just showing us the features in the Scablands, those are pretty large and people would say those are some of the largest floods that have been recorded. But when we take that back to the Sahara, that's on an entirely different scale. It's much more vast, which is pretty incredible to think of. Well, the landscapes, yeah, I don't know if the features themselves are a whole lot bigger, but the area over which they can be displayed are is huge, absolutely huge. Yeah, it's like hundreds of miles. Yeah, so are you seeing a blank screen? Yeah. Okay, good. So what we're going to hear is these are some uh, rippled features, um, Rogan Moraine type features that are produced by flowing water. And I'm just going to show a succession of uh, satellite photography here that you can actually see. If you look carefully, here's ripples. Um, and you see uh, it, whether the exact shape of the ripples is basically dependent upon the turbulence in the water. If it's a steady flow, you're going to have nice, clean, sculpted ripples parallel if the water starts getting turbulent then you have a whole continuum of, of various forms that you'll see as i go through here you'll you'll notice some of this you'll notice here this this is a rippled terrain this is in washington this rippled terrain is produced by huge floods and here you can see the water was a bit more turbulent because you can actually see a gradation of where you're you're transitioning from from ripples that are tend to be more organized with parallel banding into this more chaotic structure here. And again, that's a function of turbulence. So I'm just showing these examples here so people can get a sense of the, the variety of terrains that can be produced by uh, gigantic water flows. And then this is something else here, these mega scale glacial lineations. Again, notice here this kind of chevron shape. And again, the blunt end of the chevron the pointed end of the chevron is pointing up current and you see different gradations of them here and look particularly here at these lineations these are generally attributed to the glaciers but i think there's a school of thought that's that's gaining more and more credibility as research comes in that these are, are actually the product of subglacial water flows and you see a continuum of them here but in any case, what we're interested in here is these linear patterns like this. And here's another variety of them. Now, this would have been a flow from lower right to upper left. Here's another variation. Look at these. See the lineations. Look at these landscapes, because I'm showing these as, as parallel landscapes. Now, we've got two explanations here for the features we've just been looking at. Water flow and glacier movement. And I think it's actually a combination of both. But I think that these lineations may be the result primarily of subglacial water flow. And here again, you see the, these mega scale lineations that are now showing up. You don't really see them from the ground, but you see them when you're, you know, you're well up uh, in altitude above them. After having looked at that, we'll stop the share here. And then I'm going to go back to the Google Earth of the region of the 
RECAT structure. And we're seeing very similar lineations. Are you seeing this on? Yep, I can see it. Okay, so now you see these linear features. How did these get here? Well, we just saw that we have virtual duplicates of these kinds of features that are associated with glaciers. And what I'm suggesting is that there's a school of thought that suggests that they actually may be produced by water flow. And so is that what we're seeing here? I don't know, but it certainly is suggestive and is consistent with, yeah, look at this. But we don't, there, there's no evidence that there were glaciers here, which is the mystifying part. But here now, you can start seeing some of this kind of similar drumlinized or, or similar type of landscape that we were just looking at. See, with the rounded to blunt ends. Now, it, we, I just showed you a, a photograph of Washington State where you've got virtually identical topographic features. And no one is going to argue that they weren't created or sculpted by water. So then I think when we add that in and then we've, we get these current ripples here, let's try something. Let's go to 3D and see what we're looking at here. That kind of looks like the current ripples over on West Bar a little bit, but way larger. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, were these created by wind or water? Well, I think they're on too big of a scale to have been created by wind. And I think that it's likely that they were created by water. And the wind is subtly shaping them by blowing, continuously blowing sand over them. But when we look at this, I think we are seeing evidence of some pretty major water flows. Again, flowing over the landscape, heading off into the ocean. And that is likely what exposed this. Now, we can actually see, I think, look at here. This is, looks like a channel right here, a flow channel right here. You see this, there's actually, looks like could have been the bank, temporary bankment. And look at here, look. It almost looks like a succession of extinct shorelines, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I know you're saying that from our current point of view, the water is flowing down towards, you know, from up to down. Yes which is generally the way it usually flows from up to down. Uh, yeah. But so how did all that water get up there? So would there be a tsunami that would push it all, all, all the way in there and then come drain out? No, I would think that it, we're talking about mega scale pluvial events. I think we're talking about intense prolonged rainfalls that I, th I think that would be the most likely explanation. I mean, torrential rainfalls lasting for days if not weeks and if you zoom out and get a full scale of the, the sahara when you're done with that we also see what i would say almost very similar over in chad and going up towards egypt it looks like it's all flowing down from libya and egypt into chad that those uh yeah well i believe it looks to me like you've got water seen like right here we're at 571 a thousand. So there's an upland right here. And then it descends down. Yeah. So if you look at this area here, I'm suspecting that, let's see, you got almost 2000 feet there and then you're 1200. So you got a, you got a drop of 800 feet right here in a short distance. So if you had the same torrential rainfall falling over uh, Northeastern Africa, that water is running down here towards the the Nile River, and that is going to submerge Cairo and the Giza Plateau completely. And interestingly, if you were to remove the uh, sedimentary deposit from the Nile Valley, you've got a canyon there underneath that's filled in with sediment that's as deep as the Grand Canyon. So there's been some serious erosion in there that not only had to cut the channel down into the bedrock, thousands of feet deep, but then had to fill that canyon with sediment. So I think that the evidence is consistent with a, what I will call a mega scale pluvial event over North Africa. 
most likely consistent with the Pleistocene Holocene transition and the great flooding events that we know are well documented from other places in the world. And I mean, we can look at some of these other land, like let, let's zoom in here for a second here at, at, uh, at uh, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and, and check out what you've got. Look at this. Yeah, that's incredible. I was looking at that earlier today. If you go to the left as well, you see those, um, I forget what you call them, but further to the left, there's long streaks of this reddish sand and it just boggles your mind. It, it looks like it's all created by water, but that's a heck of a lot of water. Yeah. Well, my guess might be that, okay, we're at what? Can we zoom in here? We're at uh, uh, 15, 1,600 feet above sea level. That gets up to 2,000 feet above sea level. Okay, down here near Oman, we're getting pretty low. We're at five to 800 feet above sea level. What I would speculate is a very large sea wave coming in from the south and essentially washing over this whole peninsula. What about the northern or central part of Saudi Arabia? It almost looks like it's coming from the north to the south, those streaks. Is that yeah. go along with it too? Well, I haven't really examined that area, but I mean, look at this. Yeah. So this is a uh, pretty extraordinary landscapes, no matter how you slice it. I mean, there's a lot of things that we're still have to figure out yet. Absolutely. But to me, this is quite extraordinary. There's also similar patterns down in Australia I've seen as well. Just massive tracts of land with these sand patterns throughout. Well, yeah, look, look, look at, look at this right here. That's a, that's probably a gigantic channel right there. It looks like it's about four or 500 feet below. Let's see. That's well, that's 1,700 feet right there, 16, 1,700 up to 2,000. And when you get down here, you're 279 feet. So, you know, this is more than 1,000 feet below the upland here. And it was probably discharge coming down th through this way, headed, and, and then look, look here, you got a submarine canyon right off the coast, cut down into the, into the continental shelf. I would suggest, I guess, the final thing I would suggest that, that this evidence of potential massive floods coming, mega floods flowing off of, off of northwestern Africa is consistent with what we've seen from many other places around the world, that there were extreme flooding events that occurred and which raises its own set of questions. So I think we could go a couple of things. Three possible sources for mega floods. One, uh, flash melting of glaciers, such as what we see up in the Channel Scablands of Washington. Two, um, large scale tsunamis making landfall, which could lead to massive flooding along coastlines that can certainly be enough to wipe out whole cities, whole settlements. And then finally, flooding that is a result of extreme rainfall. And in some of my podcasts, I'll be talking and have talked about extreme rainfall events in history. And we know how quickly a watershed or a catchment basin can be overwhelmed. And within two days of rain, a catchment basin can be overwhelmed. If you had two weeks or a month of rain, yeah, you could completely obliterate an existing catchment basin. And we're going to be getting into that in greater depth as we go forward and look at extreme events mega scale events, catastrophic events in the history of this planet and how they may have affected our species of human beings and our attempts to build civilization.